Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce you our keynote speaker this afternoon, Professor uh, Thomas Matutus, uh, who is a very good friend of us and um, is a professor of social geography at the Department of Geography uh, at Arocopio University and director of the Institute of Urban and Rural Sociology uh, of the National Center for Social Research in uh, Athens. Um, so I'm really very happy and uh, uh, I feel very honored to have uh, Professor Thomas Malutus once again here with us uh, uh, at Tigot. Uh, thanks for, for coming. Well, Professor Malutus um, holds a diploma in architecture from the Ecole Spéciale d'Architecture uh, Paris and a diploma de to the Profondi in Geography from the University of uh, Paris 10, Nanterre and also a doctor's degree in geography, also from the University of Paris 10. He held several high-level positions, such as Deputy Director of the National Center for Social Research, Coordinator of the Synod of Presidents of Greek Research Centers, Director of the National Center for Social Research, and also he has served as General Secretary for Research and Technology of the Ministry of Education in Greece between 2015 and 2016. Uh, his uh, research interests um, are mainly in uh, urban social geography, but uh, as you know, he has written extensively uh, in uh, different topics such uh, as social and spatial changes in world cities, urban segregation, social and ethnic ratio, housing and welfare systems, urbanization and social mobility, comparative urbanization models with a focus on Southern Europe, socioeconomic classification models, and also socio-spatial data management and analysis. Uh, most of uh, his publications are, as I've already mentioned, in the field of urban social geography. Uh, he has an extensive list of publications, um, extensive and diverse, but the more recent are part of the critical discussion of dominant theoretical claims <coughs> regarding social polarization and socially divided cities within capitalist globalization. At the same time, uh, they discuss the importance of contextual differences in relation to varieties of capitalism, but also in terms of different historical paths of urbanization. These theoretical concerns have contributed to formulating research questions and to carrying out projects focused on Greek urban space and in particular on the social spatial changes in um, the metropolitan area of Athens. An important feature of his work is the often uneasy articulation between concepts and theories generated in car contexts due to their interpretive limits when applied to different contexts like Southern Europe. In fact, this is really very important and uh, innovative approach of uh, his uh, work. And yes, you probably know some of the most important publications related with this. So the constant exploration of these limits eventually leads to unveiling the contextual limits of concepts and theories presumed universal. The largest part of the empirical investigations comprising this work is devoted to the analysis of social structures and inequalities and their dynamic change within the Greek urbanization process in the post-war period and its aftermath. A very important contribution of his work is to have pinpointed and analyzed the different patterns and processes of residential uh, segregation in Athens and the ways they are intertwined with broader socio-economic and political processes. So macro structure are really embedded in um, his uh, research. 
Another feature of this body of work is the extensive use of statistical and mapping techniques <coughs> and the analysis of large data sets, uh, both census data and large surveys that have permitted to depict a very detailed image of the aforementioned processes in the metropolitan space of the Greek capital, but also in comparative perspective with other uh, metropolis, and particularly in southern Europe. I will not refer to his publication, so as I mentioned, a um, very extensive uh, uh, list. Uh, and of course, um, their publication, his publications are based uh, in uh, important projects, some of them European, funded uh, projects. Uh, one of the most recent diverse cities is being funded by FP7. So uh, yes, uh, often invited as keynote speaker for high profile scientific uh, events. So uh, let's listen to his talk. Um, the changing landscape of housing for migrants and refugees in EU's Southeastern uh, border. Thank you, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lucinda. Uh, your introduction is intimidating for me. And, uh, <laughs> it's uh, raising uh, expectations beyond uh, limits. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, first of all, I Thank you very much for this uh, invitation and uh, I really enjoy coming to, to Lisbon uh, every time and uh, I will not refuse, uh, refuse any invitation in the future. So, <laughs> uh, I will take advantage of this, I will take a note. <laughs> what Lucinda said uh, uh, about uh, theoretical uh, explorations and all that, it is not something that you will hear today in my talk. When I thought uh, what I should uh, present today, uh, I finally uh, decided to, to tell you a story about uh, a city which is uh, quite similar with uh, Lisbon in the other uh, uh, eastern side of uh, southern Europe uh, and uh, by hearing that story since uh, many of you are experts on uh, analyzing the social and spatial uh, issues in Lisbon uh, probably you can uh, uh, put two and two together and uh, see similarities and dissimilarities and uh, at the end of the day what uh, I would like to, to convey is that uh, uh, the, the longer we go towards the past, the more context dependent we were, the more we approach uh, nowadays, uh, the global forces uh, bring us together, even though context uh, continues to play uh, a very important role. So, so the content of my talk is uh, mainly about uh, uh, waves of uh, people moving to Athens under different uh, conditions, uh, how these waves have been uh, housed uh, in that city, and uh, I will uh, try to put an emphasis on the uh, final period, uh, the recent period, uh, and on the issues of uh, housing affordability, especially during the crisis and uh, after the, the crisis of the 2010s. Uh, And most of my talk is uh, fueled by three publications. Uh, one uh, is a book uh, I published uh, 
on uh, Athens' social geography. Uh, it should look uh, Greek to you, uh, <laughs> because it's Greek. <laughs> and so it's uh, inaccessible. So you cannot critique me on that. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, other, the other two are two papers. Uh, one published uh, last year with uh, several other colleagues, and it's about uh, uh, the importance of Airbnb in uh, reshaping uh, real estate and uh, housing affordability in Athens. And the other one uh, is uh, something that we submitted uh, a few days ago to the journal, and uh, which is more or less uh, uh, more uh, uh, close to what I'm going to say today, and uh, we hope that uh, it will not be rejected. So the four uh, distinct periods of migrant flow since the early uh, 20th century uh, comprise, first of all, uh, a large wave of uh, migration in the 1920s. Uh, at this period, uh, Athens uh, uh, had a population of uh, about 450,000 people. And uh, during that decade, uh, it reached uh, 8,000, 800,000 people. So it almost, the population almost doubled. And this doubling was uh, mainly the effect of uh, this uh, migration. Who were the migrants? Refugees from uh, Asia Minor. Uh, after uh, a war with Turkey, which followed the First World War, and uh, after the first uh, massive uh, ethnic cleansing that uh, uh, occurred in uh, Europe and elsewhere, uh, after the Lausanne Treaty in 1923, uh, during this, uh, with this ethnic cleansing, there was over a million of Greek origin uh, people who lived uh, formerly in Asia Minor who, who were uh, brought to Greece and uh, a, a slightly a lower number of Turks who lived in mainland Greece and in uh, islands like Crete who were uh, pushed to, to Turkey. Um, uh, the, this, uh, it was not easy to uh, accommodate and integrate uh, this uh, large wave of uh, people and uh, even though they, they were Greek origin uh, uh, people, they were not at all welcome uh, in, in Athens or in Greece uh, uh, in those days. And in the map, you can see that uh, uh, the urban tissue in the 20s is the pink, uh, it's not pink of the... It's... Uh, 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 wrong move. Uh, but, right. It's these areas. Uh, in the center of Athens, and in, I have to put both these areas in the center of Athens and Pyrenees. Those were the existing uh, areas of the urban tissue, and all the other circles you see are the camps of uh, the refugees that were established uh, so outside the. And uh, it took a very long time to gradually integrate uh, those people who were treated as uh, foreigners, as uh, difficulties, as uh, uh, Turkish uh, seeds. Uh, that was the, the name they were called after. Uh, so it's, it's the, the customary story for migrants uh, uh, 
in most places. Uh, and during this uh, period, uh, the city received more or less 50,000 people per year, although it received many more in 22, 23, and then from 24, the numbers were. Uh, but on an average, it, it was that kind of uh, uh, of size for a, for a city of 450,000. The next big wave uh, comes uh, after the Second World War and the civil war, which followed uh, immediately after the, the Second World War, uh, from 46 to 49. Uh, then you have a massive internal migration within the country, part of which uh, was uh, the biggest part of which uh, was directed to, to Athens. Uh, Athens in uh, 51 uh, was uh, about 1.3, 1.4 uh, million. Uh, in the end of uh, the 70s, it reached uh, uh, 3.1 million. So uh, again, this was not the, the outcome of uh, natural uh, Uh, natural growth, uh, the birth rate, uh, uh, it was migration, uh, internal uh, migration. Uh, in, uh, in the 80s, the country's population was uh, geographically stabilized. Uh, so, this is the 30 years uh, immediately after the Civil War. And for those years, you have an average of uh, 55,000 people coming to Athens uh, uh, every, every year. Then, uh, in the 90s, you have the third wave, uh, which is immigrants this time, mostly from uh, uh, bordering countries in the Balkans and mainly Albania. Uh, Albanians uh, still are more than 50% of the migrant population in Greece. And uh, uh, here we, we are talking about uh, uh, a population of 400,000 in 2011. Uh, the, this migrant population has uh, come to Athens mainly in the 90s. And it has been increased slightly in, uh, in the 2000s. We don't have the numbers for 2010, the 2010s, uh, but uh, my estimation is that uh, it is even less than uh, the increase we had uh, uh, in, the, in the 2000s. Uh, what has happened uh, in between the 90s and the, and the 2000s was a, a difference in the profile of uh, migrants. In the 2000s, you don't have any longer uh, people coming from uh, the Balkan Peninsula. You, you have more from uh, uh, war zones in uh, Asia, uh, from places in the Middle East and all that. Numbers this time are uh, low. It's about 15,000, 16,000 per year for uh, uh, the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s. And then the last flow is the refugee flow. Uh, in, starting in the early 2000s, Yes. Uh, the refugee flow is huge. Uh, over a million have crossed Greece, but Greece was not uh, their destination. Uh, only slightly 
above uh, 100,000 have remained uh, in Greece. And in Athens, uh, it's uh, between 40 and 50,000. Um, the, the peak was in 2015. And uh, nowadays, uh, in 2019, and uh, it seems that uh, this uh, new trend continues, uh, there is an increase in uh, uh, people coming, especially uh, through the AGMC. If we calculate an average uh, of this uh, uh, inflow, not taking into account those who, who have been uh, uh, transitioning through Greece. It's about uh, 7,500 per year. Um, this law has been uh, modified uh, and impacted upon uh, by uh, policies of the European Union and uh, policies of specific uh, countries like Austria, countries that close the borders and have reshaped uh, what was happening. Uh, these migrants mainly come from Syria, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Those are the uh, main uh, sources. The ways these uh, different flows have been uh, housed and integrated into uh, the urban society of Athens have been different because we are talking about different people. Uh, the internal migrants have mainly been housed through two different systems. The one uh, very uh, spread third world countries, but also in uh, uh, the same periphery like uh, Southern Europe, is uh, self-promotion. Uh, self-promotion <coughs> provided uh, an easy access to home ownership because uh, tenancy was not uh, a, a functional uh, <coughs> for the conditions of uh, the country and the city in that uh, period. And it was politically promoted by governing parties uh, at that time, as it was uh, well combined with uh, the clientelist uh, housing system. And uh, uh, as it was uh, discussed uh, very nicely by uh, a young uh, colleague, uh, it was supported very much by the US who were the tutor of Greece after the Second World War, uh, replacing Great Britain uh, this war. Uh, in this um, war. And the Americans uh, saw it as a laboratory of uh, a de, not depoliticizing, but uh, uh, bringing closer to conservative parties, the former supporters of uh, the Communist Party uh, during the, the civil war. <coughs> With this uh, self-promotion uh, uh, system, it was mainly the native uh, working class uh, that was housed in the broad western periphery of the city. Then there was a, uh, another, uh, uh, let's say, quite particular housing system, but very effective uh, in Athens and uh, to a lesser extent in some other Greek uh, cities, the land for flood system, uh, through which uh, there was a boom in uh, producing apartment buildings. Uh, and this has uh, completely reshaped the uh, housing stock of the city and has also reshaped the social geography of the city. I cannot go into depth uh, with that, but 
I will come back to it uh, regarding uh, things that are happening now and uh, they concern this housing stock produced during, mainly during the 60s and 70s, 70s which uh, still house uh, more than 70% of uh, the population in the central areas of the city. Uh, both these systems, uh, in fact, provided affordable housing uh, to different types of uh, clientele. Uh, the first uh, to working class, manual laborers, uh, uh, recent migrants from the countryside, the second to, uh, to people in, uh, in a click higher in the social mobility hierarchy, uh, lower middle class and uh, higher working class. In the 90s, uh, and the early 2000s, you have the immigrant wave. How were they housed in a, in a context of, uh, like Portugal, of a residual welfare state, where you don't have uh, a developed housing policy, uh, where you didn't have also a developed uh, migration policy? Uh, in a context of uh, laissez-faire. Uh, in general, we can say that the migrants at this period were lucky in inverted commas because uh, Greece was uh, on a good uh, economic uh, trend and uh, they could find uh, niches both in the labor market and in the housing market. Uh, However, the housing market was undergoing uh, substantial uh, uh, changes uh, during that period. Uh, the banks, private banks, were for the first time uh, very active in uh, mortgage lending, and this uh, created uh, an increase a spectacular increase in inequalities of access to housing, access to new home ownership. Uh, but this was not felt very much in the city uh, because it corresponded to an era where the working class was already uh, owning uh, their houses and was shrinking so they could uh, manage and uh, uh, through in interfamilial, uh, intrafamilial uh, 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 transactions, they could accommodate their needs with the existing housing stock. Uh, this uh, developed mortgage lend lending uh, induced prices to, to climb uh, quickly and it was uh, a middle-class game uh, and it, it was related to the uh, suburbanization of uh, middle-class groups during uh, that period. Uh, concerning migrants, what was happening, uh, what happened in, uh, in that period was that uh, they found a, an empty stock or empty stock in the in the city center, where uh, where from uh, middle class households were gradually uh, moving to suburban areas. Uh, this is why you see that the pattern of concentration of migrant groups being uh, very uh, focused in uh, central areas. Okay. And as you can see in the little diagram, uh, the central municipality, which was generally losing, which is, is losing population since the 80s, uh, has also a change in the profile in terms of nationality of population. Uh, it loses 
uh, native Greeks at a very uh, steep rate, but gains uh, foreign migrant uh, uh, people. So, uh, in this, uh, under these conditions, migrants uh, found not due to policies, but to uh, to market changes and uh, other groups' movements found affordable housing in the central area of the city and mainly in the disadvantaged apartments left over by middle-class groups. And those disadvantaged apartments are usually at the bottom floors of apartment buildings in, uh, in Africa. The housing of refugees in the, in the 2010s, a completely different story. Uh, the housing of refugees has always been considered as a separate issue, as an issue which is temporary, as uh, refugees are considered temporary and transient population. Uh, so, uh, for a temporary and uh, transient problem, we need emergency solutions, and uh, sooner or later we, we will not have to, to deal with it. Which is not true, of course, but uh, this is not uh, uh, What made uh, things even more difficult was that uh, all this happened again within a context of uh, residual uh, welfare state, of not knowing how to do, uh, to implement solutions for that. Uh, plus, it was at the heart of the crisis of uh, 2010. So, uh, no knowledge, but also no, no funds for that. So, uh, there was, uh, uh, fortunately, in the assistance of uh, organ international organizations like uh, UNHCR and different NGOs that uh, uh, operated and still operate uh, in Greece. And the solutions were uh, mainly two. Uh, the one is camps. And uh, the other, which is more humane and uh, more uh, productive in many respects, is rented accommodation. Uh, there is also a small, very small part uh, uh, related to squatting uh, and uh, assisted informally by uh, NGOs, uh, etc. Uh, the, the fact that uh, the the housing of refugees has been treated as a separate problem, has been unproductive in any, uh, in any respect. And, of course, uh, uh, it was an obstacle in uh, uh, putting together integration policies. Because in the conception of the problem, these people are not to be integrated are to be assisted and then uh, to move on. Let's come to the crisis. Where do we... Can I... Ah. Uh, the impact of the crisis uh, obviously was not uh, positive in any, uh, in any respect. Uh, Regarding the general impact, you can, uh, you can say, that first of all, that uh, uh, it was harder on, uh, on tenants, uh, who are the, the most uh, vulnerable uh, part of the equation. Uh, through uh, reduction of uh, income, uh, unemployment uh, often, uh, and, uh, indu and those things inducing them to losing their, their homes, uh, being marginalized, becoming homeless, uh, and all that. Uh, however, uh, 
uh, the displacement uh, uh, through income reduction and uh, unemployment was less than uh, one would expect in other conditions because uh, in the Greek rental market you have the, a very important dominance of the small landlord and the small landlord is not able to close uh, his or her property and uh, say goodbye to the tenant. So uh, even uh, if uh, a tenant uh, uh, was paying 300 uh, euros before the crisis and could only pay 150 uh, under crisis conditions, often uh, there was an arrangement between the two parties uh, because the landlord uh, would, in the case of losing the, the tenant, would not find another tenant and would lose even the 150 euros. So, so there was a kind of social compromise and the, the landlords worked uh, as a kind of buffer in, uh, in this uh, during this uh, period. Not in every case, of course, but it, it was uh, uh, quite often that uh, this happened. Uh, the impact on homeowners was uh, less direct, but uh, it, it affected them, especially through the rapid rise of uh, uh, property taxes, uh, which uh, following the instructions of, of the Troika uh, have uh, changed the conception of how properties should be taxed. Uh, usually, uh, traditionally, uh, properties in Greece were taxed on the basis of uh, when you acquired uh, the property. Then you paid 11% huge tax and then you were free, more or less. Uh, you paid a very, very small uh, property tax for, for the use of your property. With uh, the Troika and the crisis, things changed uh, because they wanted much more mobility in the, in the uh, property market. So, a uh, reduction of transaction taxes to 3% and an uh, increase by six times of uh, property taxes for the use of your property. This changed very much uh, the, uh, the background and it, it was a, another factor that uh, induced uh, uh, small landlords to be more lenient with uh, their uh, tenants if they couldn't afford to comply with uh, the rental agreement they had uh, signed before the crisis. Uh, the impact uh, of the crisis on the refugees uh, was a little bit more, uh, more or less what I said before. Uh, reduced funds of the state because of the crisis, EU policies with uh, Dublin uh, II and uh, on the other hand and on the opposite direction the agreement between uh, EU and Turkey for uh, a reduction of uh, uh, mobility through the Aegean. Uh, and the anti-refugee measures of the... All these uh, affected uh, the flows in different ways. Uh, also, uh, there, there was an important, uh, uh, an important factor in the equation, a government of the left. Uh, maybe when uh, they were in power, we couldn't uh, appreciate what uh, this means. Now that the right is back uh, in power, we can appreciate what we lost. <laughs> uh, 
I'm not uh, a how is it uh, an independent uh, judge. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can see which uh, side I'm being on. It's what is the and the aftermath of the crisis. Uh, so the, the crisis has produced impacts, but uh, not in the extent that usually we fantasize that the crisis produces. Uh, the crisis has produced more uh, stability because of before the storm, rather the, the stormy weather itself. Uh, and this stability uh, is related to a literal uh, standstill in the housing market and in the property market. Due to the absence of demand, it was again not a question of policies. It, it was uh, what the market was, uh, uh, was doing in, in these uh, Periods. There was no internal demand because the, the country lost 25% of its uh, uh, national product, which is uh, catastrophic, and there was no uh, foreign investment interest. So things uh, were at a, stand, at a standstill, and this did not produce some kind of massive property dispossession and change of hands during uh, the crisis. And then we come to 2018, the summer, where uh, officially the crisis is over. Uh, what the crisis is over means uh, is a question for another. Uh, But already you can see that uh, uh, there is a, a very positive uh, account of what's happening in the property market, in housing and all that, uh, in uh, the press. Uh, but this is not due to the rise of uh, endogenous uh, demand. This is mostly due to the rise of uh, foreign demand. And in every, uh, in every um, hundred uh, transactions, 75 are a foreign uh, investment uh, thing. So, so it's a huge uh, number. Uh, other things that uh, uh, I was telling you, uh, the contents of another slide. So I'm uh, going to retract a little bit. Uh, the first thing I wanted to tell you is uh, the impact of political change, especially the impact of political change since uh, last summer. Uh, so that there was a, a replacement of uh, the left uh, government by the new democracy government, the Conservative Party. No. Uh, this, in terms of housing, has uh, produced several, uh, uh, several changes. Uh, the one is uh, the end of uh, protection for uh, uh, first residents. If uh, you have a mortgage that you cannot uh, repay, until now uh, there was a protection if uh, you, you were a household of low means, and uh, uh, your property was not above uh, a certain amount of uh, value. And now, uh, in, uh, beginning uh, next day, April, uh, in uh, a month and a half, there will be no protection. Uh, so, uh, if your property, if you don't pay your loan, your property will be uh, confiscated. And this is part of a general uh, movement of, of change, uh, reducing the, the, the anemic 
welfare uh, uh, services that uh, the former uh, government tried to put in, uh, uh, in the motion. And uh, it, it's a change of uh, how you invest public funds, much less uh, for the welfare of low needs households, and much more, the same funds go to another draw, uh, for tax reductions, who uh, correspond to another type of uh, social profile. In terms of uh, refugee housing, uh, there you have very important uh, differentiations. We are back to the CAM uh, approach and uh, specifically to the detention camp approach. It's not a camp where you, you will be able to circulate and outside. It's a camp that until you get the asylum, uh, uh, your, your, uh, yes, uh, until you get your, uh, your documents stamped, you will be, in fact, a prisoner. Uh, this comes with uh, limitations for, uh, uh, for, that uh, sometimes are even inhuman. Uh, a reduction of the possibility of uh, uh, young uh, migrant refugee children yeah, to, to, to go to school uh, and uh, different... Uh, so I'll uh, speed up the, the best part will be... Uh, so, uh, zero tolerance to squatting, uh, blaming uh, nowadays the NGOs uh, for uh, whatever happens with uh, 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 migrants in Lesbos, uh, where now uh, they are in, uh, in one of the most uh, renowned camps in Moria. Uh, you have over 20,000 refugees in a camp that uh, should uh, not host uh, more than 2,000. Plus, uh, a limited uh, uh, regulation of uh, the short rental market. And I'm coming to, to this part. Uh, do I have five minutes? Huh? Uh, so, uh, the, the, the scene has uh, completely changed in, uh, in Athens. Uh, through the, the increase of foreign demand for uh, properties. And this increase has been uh, uh, the outcome of uh, increased tourism on the one hand, and uh, the policy for golden visa, uh, which is something that Portugal also uh, does. Uh, this has been amplified through the short-term rental uh, pattern uh, via platforms uh, like uh, Airbnb, Putin's and, uh, and it's not a sharing economy in any way, since 85% of uh, units that are put on the market are whole homes and not sharing a room or something like that. I think in Portugal it's uh, 67 percent. Uh, we are worse. And the regulation is just limited to uh, preventing tax avoidance. Uh, that's all. Uh, the areas affected by this uh, new thing is, uh, uh, of course, uh, areas of tourist interest, but also uh, a broader areas of the center where you have uh, affordable housing operating nowadays. Uh, and the important thing with uh, which I will uh, finish is uh, that uh, 
uh, this aftermath, uh, these things that are happening in the aftermath of the crisis are uh, putting in danger the function of the Athenian apartment building, which made the city relatively ungentrified. Why? Because uh, uh, these apartment buildings were uh, vertically stratified and uh, an ordinary gentrifier, a regular gentrifier, would like to go on top where you have the, the, the nice apartments. But these nice apartments were already occupied by other middle class people. So uh, you wouldn't displace a poor guy to, 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 uh, by yourself. Uh, now, with uh, the short-term uh, rental uh, uh, explosion, uh, what happens is that uh, you don't have any more the regular, the ordinary gentrifier, but you have the occasional, the occasional tourist gentrifier, who uh, can be placed in a disadvantaged apartment in the ground floor or even uh, a little bit underground uh, where you could never place the regular gentrifier provided that this uh, disadvantaged apartment is uh, well refurbished, uh, modernized, uh, with a wide screen <coughs> and uh, whatever. Uh, the, lo the location of these places is very central. So, this is very convenient for tourists. And uh, if you refurbish an apartment like this, you can sell it for a much uh, lesser price than the average hotel uh, room. So this creates an imminent danger for a massive displacement of uh, people who are who found their only housing uh, option in this city and uh, they will not find another option somewhere else unless they go and uh, uh, it's not something that uh, is uh, happening for the time being in a very large scale rents are uh, growing especially in the city center but still you don't have immense uh, pressure and immense uh, impact because there are uh, buffers again uh, a stock of uh, unoccupied uh, uh, apartments and all that that can uh, play a buffer role so uh, this is something that uh, is an open issue for uh, for Athens it's uh, something that cannot be dealt with as usual without policies, but the political conditions are not uh, giving you the, the, the hope that uh, policies will be in the direction of uh, protecting uh, uh, low-income uh, households' uh, interests. The rest yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Uh, unfortunately, um, we started with a delay. Um, but uh, uh, I, I really want to give the opportunity to, for the audience to ask one or two questions. Um, so the floor is open. Okay, Warden, please. Um, George? Um, no, I have a question and a, a slight commentary. Um, it's remarkable how similar the patterns are between, um, between Lisbon and, and, and Athens, although they seem to be in a different time. Uh, for instance, regarding short-term rentals, I would say we read more advanced um, 
The second part of the commentary is also, you mentioned twice how this uh, demand or lack of demand, of internal demand or foreign demand, um, was, was not because of policy. Um, but thinking of, for instance, the Lisbon case and the Troika requirements, uh, for instance, regarding housing, they were very specific. Uh, they had to do with the rental market liberalization, um, and also, so, so there was a view of EU policy uh, that they didn't need to be foreign investment as quickly as possible. So, and this impacts on, on demand. And I'm wondering if Athens, although you say this was not policy designed, in fact, it sort of was by the EU policy design. And then the, the very uh, pinpoint question is. At the end of this process, for instance, in Lisbon, as in Madrid or Barcelona, you're having very large corporations buying uh, apartments one by one until they become hundreds. Uh, and it, do you know if that's happening in Athens at the moment? Thank you. George, please, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Thank you all just for the very interesting presentation. I'm following very much the question of, of Eduardo. In the second step of uh, Eduardo, my friend and colleague, the, in the second stage of financialization, which she has described, that involves international funds, a lot of foreign investment, that is pushed by uh, liberalization of the housing market following a set of uh, regulations established, uh, first ones in 2009 and in 2013. The, the thing is, there is this gap of five years, apparently, between Athens and Lisbon, or it seems at least, and you advanced, as far as I can understand, two explanations. One is the specific structure of the city center, or vertical segregation, and the vertical social structure of the houses in the, the center of Athens. And if anything, the second one is the government. So when the policy started, the government in Greece was a left-wing one, so maybe some measures in direction of liberalization were more controlled. And I wanted to know if this is true. You, you gave some idea, but apparently some of these things, golden visas, etc., were also promoted by the previous government, not by the one that is now in power. And in addition to this, is there any other factor that you think justifies the difference between Lisbon and Athens, which seems so parallel until the period of the crisis. Thank you. Thank you. So we have these two questions and then we have to finish. No, thank you for your presentation. So we will remember this given the social sciences in the city. Rather short question, which also links uh, with all those and your previous uh, research on contextual difference in gentrification. The question would be, is in light of all these global trends, golden visas, uh, Airbnbs, platforms, etc., that contextual difference somehow disappearing or just changing? Thank you. Could you please have the Ooh. microphone for the last question? Thank you for your presentation. In fact, I would like to, to ask you a question about uh, the um, existential meaning of housing. Um, yeah, because in this conference, the housing is the central topic. I'm not an expert. It's about, yes, uh, but I think that uh, you have a knowledge uh, and experience, especially from uh, the history of Athens to to, to, to have uh, an answer. So, I would like to, to ask you about the distinction between uh, the family house and the collective house. What I mean is that the experience of uh, refugees and migrants um, nowadays, but I suppose also in the previous uh, uh, decades, uh, give us a new example of collective living, either in a camp or in a school in the center of Athens. Um, typically, there is uh, a claim for the right to housing. However, the house, on the one hand, is a secure and a safe space for someone to live, but at the same time, it's like an isolated space. We have many examples of refugees that uh, have a right to access to a house from an NGO, and they finally 
prefer to stay in the home or in the sport because there is their community. It's a collective life. It's a life with a meaning. The children have friends. So the question is, if we can reimagine and to relearn from the experience of refugees the meaning of housing. And finally, if you can suggest any proposals for regulations or I don't know, to transform occupied buildings in the center of Athens, to transform them to collective houses for refugees. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah. okay. thank you for the questions. I, I need to. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm very happy that uh, you uh, also see the, the the similarities, but also the interesting uh, differences between uh, uh, Lisbon and Athens. And it's uh, an opportunity to come together and uh, produce uh, uh, work on uh, comparative... Uh, uh. Now, uh, I'm not sure I, I can uh, respond to everything. Uh, large corporations interested in, uh, in this uh, showing that uh, there are changes uh, uh, of a different sort in the... Uh, there is rumor about uh, large corporations doing uh, such things, but uh, we are far from uh, conditions in other cities and especially in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, I would say that uh, if uh, we are uh, in this process uh, some years behind, let's say, Lisbon, uh, it's probably a path dependency issue uh, because uh, housing has been uh, a privileged field uh, protected by policies uh, for up to the 1990s uh, where big banks, private banks, were uh, forbidden to, to play in this field, where big construction companies uh, could not find their place. Uh, so these uh, big players that we in the Iberian Peninsula and mainly in Spain were uh, uh, developing their, uh, uh, their strategies since the, the, the 50s, it's not something that has happened in Greece at all. So, so housing was uh, a, an issue for the small player the settler or the small builder. So, and this created a kind of uh, a political, economic, and social uh, construction that it was uh, difficult to undo even under the conditions of the crisis. And when the Troika uh, suggested, suggested, uh, <laughs> different uh, routes, even uh, it was not the government of the left that was particularly against. Even governments of the right, uh, in order to preserve their, uh, their power, uh, said that uh, if we do that, it's suicidal politically. So they, they tried to, to postpone. To this probably was less uh, important in... Uh, uh, but it is something that is, it is gradually deconstructed also in Greece. And this brings me to your uh, question, if global forces bring us more together, this is what I said in the beginning, that uh, uh, they bring us more together. I, I for many years, 
suggested that uh, Athens is uh, ungentrified. Now I'm not so sure anymore. Uh, so, uh, but even though uh, contextual uh, uh, diversity uh, plays a, a lesser role, it's still there. And politics are still there, uh, even more. Regarding your question, uh, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's not a yes or a no, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's very important I mean, collective living and uh, individual solutions and all that. But uh, what kind of collective living? Uh, um, unfortunately, we have to uh, close the session here. I suggest that you continue the conversation afterwards because we are really behind the schedule. Um, we move to, to the other uh, sessions. We don't have a break now. The break is after the next session. Uh, so thank you very much for. Uh,